I call it the land of enormous numbers. I mean, it is slightly ridiculous when you think of the size of some of these numbers. You need to, you know, check yourself how many zeros. It's pretty funny how uh, just a few years ago, you would have used the word trillion in any context and people's eyeballs would have popped out of their head. And now between multi-trillion dollar stimulus packages and, you know, constant analysis on energy transition, using that word and those numbers is not what it used to be. I think people have become super desensitized to it. This is Climate Tech with Kentaro, a podcast featuring the brightest minds and most influential voices in climate tech. I'm your host, Kentaro Kawamori. If you've been a listener of our podcast, it wouldn't surprise you to know that startups are looking at the climate challenge from all angles. We've featured founders like Max Nova of NCX, a company that connects corporations to buying carbon offsets to landowners in America. We've also had amazing conversations in season one with Ashley Zumwalt Forbes, who helps lead Recycle, a Texas-based company that recycles rare earth elements from electronic waste, which we know there is plenty of. Today's startup is helping the move to clean energy through intelligent software. And there's no one better to tell us about it than Peter Knowles. Peter is the president of Financial Machines, and in our conversation, he told me about how his startup evolved from a consultancy to software-based advisory, which is a feat in itself. Peter and I also dove deep into energy storage, renewable energy, and the challenges of fundraising for a startup. Peter, where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from uh, Stamford, Connecticut today on the East Coast. Stamford, Connecticut. Aha, you have a very Stamford, Connecticut accent. That's correct. Born and bred in Stamford, Connecticut. No, I'm, I'm actually <laughs> from... Uh, from Liverpool in the United Kingdom. So I've uh, I've been in the States for almost 20 years, but I've managed to uh, maintain at least some of my strange accent. Ah, wonderful place, terrible football team. We can talk <laughs> about that later. Had to get that dig in. Um, well, welcome to the podcast. We're super excited to have you. So Peter, why don't you give us a little bit of background on the company? So the company's about three years old. It started as a typical, uh, more traditional consulting engagement with a company who had identified energy storage as a growth area in the market. And more importantly, that identified it and uh, had capital backing and the commitment to put that capital to work. Uh, what they needed help with was identifying which markets in the US they should identify and build in and which specific geographical locations in those markets they should build in. And that's where financial machines came in. We worked with that company to identify the first 15 sites, which they secured and then filed interconnection agreements with the system operator, which is the precursor approvals required prior to building the actual asset. So we helped them do that. And during that, there was a mix of a mix of manual and automated analysis that we did. And during that engagement, we came upon the idea of how do we make this easier for customers? How do we make this easier for this company? How do we enable them to have the right tools at their fingertips to be able to do this analysis themselves almost effectively? And that's where the software build out came. Financial machines evolved from a consultancy, advising companies on energy management into a SaaS business model. SaaS stands for software as a service. Since then, over the last couple of years, we've been building out our software tools to allow our customers to do that. So that's really the the origin story of financial machines. Well, it's great. There's a lot to unpack there because the you know from a startup perspective, going from the consulting to the SaaS business model leap is always a difficult thing. So definitely, we'll want to dig into that. But kind of back to the core use case and uh, your customer base. I would imagine investors are your primary customers. Is that a correct assumption? I try and keep the answer to this as broad as possible. So it's anyone that is interested in valuing an asset that's either operating or to be built or anyone who's interested in optimizing and by that i mean maximizing risk adju adjusted returns out of an existing asset so that there's a you know there's a multitude of companies we're in dialogue with everything from equipment manufacturers developers lenders investors as you say and then owners and operators who could be you know small private capital backed firms or they could be large global integrated energy firms. I mean, we kind of really cover the gamut. One of our customers 
you know, operates in over 50 countries globally and has over 150,000 employees. So, you know, and on the flip side, we've got companies we're supporting with less than 10 people, but are backed by, you know, large, deep pocketed infrastructure funds or the like. Makes sense. And I know it's a pain for those teams to access, you know, high quality and affordable data as well, because many of them have been so levered on buying from the giant data brokers and then still requiring immense amount of analysis and all of that, it just becomes this crazy expensive proposition. Give us a little bit of the highlight, you know, key points on the company. Where's it headquartered? How big are you guys? It sounds like you're venture backed. You mentioned some investors. Yeah. So, uh, so we actually haven't raised money yet. We've bootstrapped the company to date. We're probably going out for our first external funding round in Q3 this year, you know, to allow us to scale the business more rapidly than we, uh, than we have been, predominantly utilizing those funds for increased development and sales and marketing. I'm the US outpost for the company. Uh, our development team is actually based in India. And we do that uh, because my partner, the, the CEO of the company, is actually based in India. He, he would be 50% there, 50% here if it wasn't for the, for the pandemic, but he's been more a hundred percent there, but that allows us really to focus on acquiring the best cost-effective talent and those cost savings we can pass through to our customers by, you know, you said, uh, analysis is not cheap. We, we are trying to make it as cheap and as effective as possible for our customers. So, you know, our, our development team is over there right now. We're pretty small. We're around 10 employees, but you know, aspirations to grow materially as we raise money and onboard more customers. Well, it's great. You don't hear enough of the bootstrapping, successful bootstrapping these days. It was, uh, you know, after the absolute crazy amount of capital in the VC markets of the last couple of years, it was almost the opposite. So it's good to see you guys, you know, building customer base and revenues ahead of that. So you know a thing or two about raising capital. Let's talk a little bit about your background and how you made your way here. And, you know, when we met you were uh, just leaving Barclays and you had a long and illustrious career there. So tell us a little bit about you as a person and your career. Yeah, I can do. Yeah, I've had a had an interesting journey. Um, you know, I, I actually started in the commodity space and the power space uh, way back in the uh, mid to late 90s. In 97, I started a, at a company called National Power in the UK, which is a, a utility. Funnily enough, I remember my... Uh, Six week training program that involved touring power stations and uh, consuming a lot of alcoholic beverages in various places in the United Kingdom, which is good fun. Of course, at that time, we were visiting coal plants, natural gas fired plants, combined cycle plants. Uh, we didn't, we didn't touch anything renewable, uh, which shows you, you know, how much the industry has, uh, has, uh, has come along. So, uh, that company split uh, and I ended up moving to a, uh, a pretty unknown company at the time called Enron, uh, and spent a couple of years there. Uh, I think most people know how, how that ended. In case you didn't know how that ended, Enron went bankrupt in 2001 after a scandal involving accounting fraud. But, you know, the core business of, uh, of Enron, the power and gas trading business was, uh, you know, extremely strong and uh, spun out a lot of, a lot of people into the broader industry that have been, uh, extremely successful. And post that couple of year period, I ended up at Barclays with 25 of my colleagues from Enron. And we went to set up the European and UK power and gas trading business for Barclays. Spent a couple of years there and uh, the industry trend was pulled back uh, from US firms. So the, the UK market is kind of small. Uh, I love the US because it's, uh, I equate it to Europe, but not divided by language. Uh, although some people may differ because, you know, a Boston accent is very different to a Texas one, but uh, to me, they're all quite similar. And so I came over to the US in 2004 and helped kind of scale up the bank's commodities business in the US. And I was running, you know, a, a team of up to 10 people uh, helping customers and they could be utilities, municipalities, generators, private equity firms, helping them uh, risk manage and, and finance their asset base. And then uh, in about 2012, the uh, Capital rules changed and our ability to risk warehouse went to practically zero. And I, and I kind of bailed out and ended up, uh, in other areas of the bank, looking at overall firm strategy, capital deployment. Uh, and then before I left, looking at planning and stress testing around capital ad adequacy, including climate stress testing, which was just an uh, emerging theme, uh, you know, two or three years ago. So all pretty interesting. You know, all in all, I'd spent 20 years at Barclays and it was, uh, time for me to leave. So I uh, 
I jumped out and, and wanted to think about where I could deploy my, you know, my skills and deploy them towards the energy transition more broadly. And so hence, uh, you know, about a year ago when we were talking, I, I partnered up with uh, Bashal Apte, who's the CEO, who happened to be my trading peer. Peter is the president at Financial Machines. Vishal is the founder and CEO. So I was the customer guy helping them, and he was the trading guy actually managing the risk. So, uh, you know, we've known each other for 20 years, worked together for 10 years, built that business together. So it was a pretty smooth transition back into our usual fun and games, but we're coming at it, you know, we're taking all the skills we learn in in our trading and risk management expertise, and we've converted that into a software service for customers. So it's funny, a lot of the customers we're talking to, we, we have a bit of a leg up because we have an existing, you know, very broad existing network of, of contacts. So for example, prospective company we're talking to backed by Blackstone, kind of good example of what I was talking about, deep pocketed, uh, you know, firm backing a management team in the energy storage space. I'm talking to a guy there who's the chief commercial officer. He used to uh, hedge coal plants. In, in the New York region. So, uh, you know, it's a quite a, uh, there's a lot of the same people, just a different business card still present in the industry, which gives us a bit of a, a bit of a leg up. And in my opinion, gives us a lot of credibility in terms of we've been around this industry for a long time and understand some of the challenges these firms and these individuals are facing. That's great. So you go from gigantic global bank to now small 10 person shop. What's been the most surprising thing in the transition for you? Interesting question. There's been a few surprising things, although some of them do port quite well from the bigger firm. So one is talent. So the ability to uh, find, acquire and retain talent is, is critical. I mean, that's true of a small firm or a big firm. But, you know, I think in a smaller firm, you really have to sell the story of the business a lot better than you would in a, a big firm where you get, you know, immediate brand recognition. So it's a lot more about the individuals running the company and the company vision when you're recruiting people. So I'd say talent, you know, retention of that and and acquiring that is is uh, been tough. I'd say time frame actually for me, I probably had a bit of an illusion when I first stepped in that everything would happen instantaneously, and I've had to recalibrate my expectations around time to deliver things and think more of uh, more along months and quarters than days and weeks. Things just take longer than you would expect, uh, particularly when you're doing most things yourself. That's right. I always tell people, you know, if you spend time in big corporate, your biggest enemies generally are not time. They're market pressures. They are complexity, bureaucracy, legacy. And in the startup, time is your greatest enemy always. doesn't matter what you're doing. Yeah. So I yeah, know that's definitely a uh, definitely adjustment. I mean, I think everyone generally has had more flexible working with the you know, the pandemic. I think that's a, a good thing generally. Uh, people are seeing a lot more of the families. Of course, I have a pretty flexible schedule. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably working as hard as I ever did, but with some flexibility. Uh, and to me, that's that's something I wouldn't get necessarily in a very large corporation. So that to me is, is quite appealing and hopefully to my family. That's an uh, incredible experience you have. And, you know, it sounds like you know, different perspective and trying something new was was key part of that decision making process. But you know, what specifically around this opportunity, you know, drew you to taking this path because you could have done a, a whole bunch of different things. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you're right. I had a bit of a checklist: small, growing, uh, interesting, learning. You know, all the key words that I wanted to tick, all those boxes I wanted to tick, and this opportunity ticked all the boxes I wanted to. And importantly, I think. You know, you've probably experienced this yourself when you're starting a business or right at the start of a business, working with people you know, respect, et cetera, is, is, is critical to me. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, I was stepping into something where it had a lot of growth potential, but the, the parameters and the risks were, were well known, particularly around the individuals I was, you know, stepping in to work alongside. That for me was, uh, was absolutely, uh, absolutely critical. So it was a, it was a good time for me and it was a good time for, you know, for my partner, Vishal, as he was looking to, to bring on someone to focus on scaling the business effectively through sales, marketing, and ultimately fundraising. Based on his previous and current work, I asked Peter about specific trends in the industry and how quickly businesses are adopting renewables and energy storage. 
I think perhaps for the listeners, maybe a bit of a backdrop on kind of where we are on the energy transition journey, because this company is really a play on facilitating that energy transition. You know, ultimately, we're trying to help these companies get more assets into the grid and also optimize those assets. So, you know, I think if we look back maybe 15 years ago, that there wasn't really any non-hydro renewable generation. And over the last 15 years, we've built up to around 15% in the US of capacity and energy in terms of renewable production, predominantly uh, wind and solar, with wind being uh, greater at least right now. You know, that still leaves about, you know, just short of two thirds of production and capacity being fossil fuel based. And so clearly, if we're to meet net zero by 2050, or if we we're to meet the Biden commitment to decarbonize the grid by 2035, uh, that two thirds needs to go down to pretty much zero. And in order to do that, there needs to be, you know, we need to put in over four times as much capacity that we've done in the last 15 years in the next 15 years. So that, that kind of frames the size of the challenge. The Biden administration has set goals to combat climate change. The first is to have 100% carbon-free electricity by 2035. After that, by 2050, the goal is to reach net zero economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions. Peter says that to cut down on fossil fuel usage, we need to ramp up renewable energy production and create storage for that energy. And as you increase the penetration of renewables in the grid, you need flexible generation to provide support to the system, um, to either load shift, which is moving cheap solar energy from in the middle of the day to when it's needed later in the day. Uh, or provide uh, balancing services to the grid like frequency response to maintain system stability. And that's where energy storage becomes, you know, becomes really, really critical. So I'd say the main trend we're seeing is increased number of companies participating uh, and the type of companies, you know, tend to be the smaller companies that are backed by those large deep pocketed, um, you know, infrastructures or asset managers with upwards of, you know, 50, 100, 150 billion of AUM who are allocating a small portion of that to, you know, season management teams to, to build and develop these assets. Got it. And on the topic of storage, from a technology perspective, what do you think is the most promising and where do you see the most investment going? I've heard a lot recently about, I think there's a lot of excitement in the investor community about pumped storage from hydro, which makes sense correlating to your, as you pointed out, the increase in hydro capacity over the last decade? Yeah, hydro has been pretty flat, actually. So oh, okay. uh, yeah, H hydro over the last 15, 20 years has been pretty flat. I, I mean, the availability of hydro sites and sites for pump storage, it, it, it's pretty hard. So, you know, I, I would see most of the renewables growth coming from, you know, wind and solar supported by battery storage. Now within, or, or energy storage, I should say, because there's other approaches than chemical energy storage, right? There's gravitational, you've got companies who are raising big concrete blocks and then dropping them, you know, so there's different approaches to chemical, but, you know, right now the dominant technology is lithium ion batteries. Uh, there are lots of other technologies looking at, you know, uh, other chemical solutions, metal flow batteries, vanadium batteries. There's a lot of people looking at different technologies to do a couple of things. One, have less reliance on lithium and other rare earth metals you need to produce the battery. So to make, you know, to take the, the supply chain and the cost issues away from that. Uh, but two, also to extend the duration of energy storage. So most of that lithium ion storage right now ranges from one hour to four hours of storage. So there's a lot of um, focus around longer durations of storage, 12 hours, multi-day storage. And that's where a lot of these technologies are focused because while lithium ion is really good at shifting within a day, if you have a large weather event that requires multiple days of storage, that, that doesn't really exist right now unless you look to some of these newer technologies or even into hydrogen where people are saying, well, I could, you know, make hydrogen with an electrolyzer powered by wind and then I can store that hydrogen and burn that hydrogen when I need. And it's, you know, it, it, you know, exhibits characteristics like natural gas. I can stick it in a tank and store it and call on it when I need for as, as long as I want, which is a function of the size of the tank. So yeah, so I see, uh, I see most of the storage coming from chemical and certainly for the next few years, lithium ion, but there is a whole host of technologies and a, an enormous amount of capital backing 
um, you know, backing new technologies from flow batteries through to even solid state batteries as well. Yeah, it, to your point, I think there's been so much capital into the storage space I hear consistently from my investor network. They're, they're sort of tired of looking at new storage deals and they feel like that market is pretty well capitalized at this point, which is good to hear. That's positive, right? It means that now there's just a period of R&D that has to happen. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of dry powder that's still out there in terms of capital been allocated, but not deployed. So th that's certainly a trend in the industry. Yeah, no doubt about that. I think mostly it's just the the appetite for storage deals specifically has gone down right there, meaning that dry powder is going to have to go elsewhere now, which is positive, which means, you know, that segment of technology has gotten the capital it needs ostensibly not guaranteed to, to further that development as an industry. What do you see for, you know, this high volatility environment and, you know, from your perspective, how do you think it impacts your space specific to renewables development and storage in the short term? I agree with what you're saying. I think we're in this business for the medium to long term, not the short term. So I think that there's a there's an imperative to enable the energy transition. If that costs a little bit more, it costs a little bit more. I, I think I've seen some estimates of what it will cost if we don't do things in terms of the insurance claims, and they're in the $150 trillion plus ranges. I mean, these numbers are just, you know, eye-poppingly, you know, over two times the global GDP to either enable the energy transition or the cost if you don't enable the energy transition. So I think on the medium to long term, it's it, it, we're absolutely on that path. I agree in the short term, the availability of capital and the cost of capital will not aid further development of renewables and energy storage because it's making the financing and the ability to make return harder. Do I see that being a huge impediment? Not right now from where I'm sad and from what I'm seeing in terms of the allocations that have already been made. I agree. And I saw the analysis making the rounds that you mentioned on uh, you know what it costs if we if we weren't to make the transition from an insurance perspective. And I, I admit I had to laugh a little bit because that is predicating that insurers would actually insure high risk assets like that. And they've already proven in, you know, drought prone regions and those sorts of things or in fire prone regions, they'll just stop offering those premiums or those policies, right? So yeah. I think it's a fun exercise to go through, but it's also one that uh, I think is a bit misleading because I don't see any scenario where insurance companies pick up that tab. They'll just simply move out into other markets. I call it the land of enormous numbers. I mean, it is slightly ridiculous when you think of the size of some of these numbers. You need to you know, check yourself how many zeros a trillion has. You know? These are enormous numbers we're talking about, and they're enormous numbers in a very short amount of time. You know, and we've done a pretty good job of, you know, as costs have come down for both wind and solar and batteries, we've done a good job of getting those assets onto the grid. But we're we're kind of right at the start of this. You know, as I said, we need to do four times as much in the next 15 years as we did in the last 15 years. And batteries are kind of new. So I need to do, you know, up to a million megawatts maybe of batteries. I mean, it, these numbers are these numbers are, are very large. So you know, I say it's not a problem medium term, but anything that derails us in the short term is slightly concerning given the amount of time we actually have to turn things around. It's pretty funny how uh, just a few years ago you would have used the word trillion in any context and people's eyeballs would have popped out of their head. And now between multi-trillion dollar stimulus packages and, you know, constant analysis on energy transition, it definitely is a uh, Using that word and those numbers is not what it used to be. I think people have become super desensitized to it because it's just too large to wrap your head around. This has been really insightful so far. Before we leave, you know, who should reach out? How do they get a hold of you guys? You know, any last messages you want to leave for the listeners? Yeah. So, I mean, I can be reached directly. I, I think you probably share my contact details, Peter at finmachines.com, or people can visit the website and there's, you know, information on our website, finmachines.com. Really anyone who's interested in, in valuing or optimizing energy storage or energy storage co-located with renewables should reach out. We think we can help you. I mean, we do have a pretty unique approach in terms of how we've, uh, how we've thought about the problem. It's probably worth just laying that out quickly. So we've gone with a modular approach. So we split out input data, optimization, and we also allow people to bring any data to our software. And that's kind of unusual. Most people try and package those things together. So we break them out and allow customers to pick. If you just want to use our engine, you want to bring anyone else's data, that's fine. Uh, you want to take our data, we can provide that too. Um, 
No one really does that. Everyone tries to package it and, and kind of lock you into all components at once. Um, we also sell at a fixed price. So we have a fixed price per market for our, for our engines. And what that means is customers can evaluate as many assets as they want, as many times as they want, under as many scenarios as they want, with whatever data they want, and they only have to pay one subscription fee. The typical model is I'll package all those things together and I'll take a percentage of revenue or I'll charge you per asset. So that's kind of really what makes the difference in terms of of what we're doing. It's our fundamental approach to this to allow our customers to choose which pieces, which modules they want and allow them that flexibility, particularly to, you know, you know, it should be software. Software to me is available on demand, accessible by the customer when they want. You know, I think uh, we try and put the customer at the center of everything we do. And we see this as almost a joint venture between us and our customers because they learn from us and and we learn from them. Uh, and that's the way we develop something that's meaningful for for the industry and all customers. Well, you're doing uh, you're doing important work, getting that data to be more accessible and more affordable. It's hard to understate how critical that is, but also how how few companies can and do do that. Right? It's it's too easy to look at it as an asset to just maximize for absolute profit and those companies that, that you mentioned oftentimes are very focused on that but they also get severely disrupted if they don't bring the economics down and make that more accessible so we're uh, very excited about what you guys are up to with that we definitely appreciate your thoughts and your insights it's been very helpful and educational really appreciate your time coming on and we'll have to do it again soon yeah great sort you guitar Make sure to check out Peter Knowles and his work at Financial Machines. Links are in our show notes. Before we go, please don't forget to subscribe to Climate Tech with Kentara on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll be back with another fantastic episode next week. Catch you all then. Climate Tech with Kentaro is produced by our incredible team at Persephone and Human Group Media. Our theme music is by Guesthouse. And if you want to learn more about Persephone and our climate management and accounting platform, please visit our website at persephone.com. Climate Tech with Kentaro.